Good morning from Miami Beach. This is Dr. John Bennett of Neurosurgical TV. Uh, we have the pleasure of hosting a series of on connecto uh, connectomics with Michael Segru uh, from Oklahoma, Sydney, uh, and now and now China. Uh, and let me introduce Mohammed Helmi, a neurosurgical resident from China, who's going to give the introductions and run the show. Good day, Mohammed. Thank you, John. Greetings from Shanghai. So, dear audience, on behalf of the course director, Professor Ben Shu, the vice president of ACNS, we welcome you in our fifth and last broadcast of Seeing the Brain Through Connectomics series. The series webinar is given by Professor Michael Shugro, who is a neurosurgeon at Brain Swalls Hospital in Sydney, the co-founder and chief medical officer at Omniscient Neurotechnology Company. Dear audience, you are welcome to write your question in Q&A box throughout the webinar or raise your hand and ask your question directly to Professor Mike. Professor Mike, we are looking forward to learning more interesting topics uh, from you tonight. So in the fifth and final lecture, I'm going to talk about a, a, con a new set of concepts. And if you've been on the other lectures, you probably have learned enough to where this lecture, which is very complicated, I'm going to warn everyone, it's complex, um, but it's going to be approachable. And what we're talking about connectomics is how do we use connectomics to make better decisions about patients? That's been this whole course. So if you've been following it, the first lecture was we talked about what are networks, okay? What are they? How are they different than how you learned neurosurgery? We then spent two lectures reviewing that and talking about doing operations and how do we do safer, better surgery? And part of it is to spare function, but also part of it is what led into lecture four. We talked about how to do rehab with brain stimulation using network concepts. And part of the reason to save networks is to save them. The second is because if you destroy them, then you have nothing to rehab. There's nothing to rehabilitate. This lecture, we're going to go in a different direction. We're going to summarize everything we know and where I'm going to really change how you think about the brain. Because our science and understanding of how the brain really works is drastically different than what it was 10 years ago. And what we know really opens up a lot of opportunities for the future. So for those of you, we spent some time working on the platform I built called QuickTome. It basically, we work with structural and functional data to integrate them. And um, we use this in this course as a teaching tool, but really it's a powerful tool that I've poured almost everything I know over many years into making this the best possible platform for it. And so, what lecture two was, how do we do surgery with quick tome? Lecture four was, how do we do rehab with quick tome? And this is really, what are we going to be building in the future to really take our understanding of the brain and the best science out there to the next level? So what I'm going to show, talk about today is that our previous understanding of the cerebrum was wrong. We know that it's not true, not that every bit of it's wrong or that we're re changing everything, but we know that there's things that just weren't accurate. They were overly simplistic. And if you've been paying attention to the last four lectures, this should be obvious to you by now, but I'm gonna go even further. More importantly, that we can, if we understand the brain, we can improve our patients' lives by doing things intelligently to rewire people. And that artificial intelligence used intelligently can show us the truth of the brain, how it works. And this is the most valuable thing we have. So I think we have to sit back. The most important changes in medicine come from actually acknowledging that the state of affairs that we have was the best that we could do, but that we might be able to do better. And what are we really not good at? It's not actually, it's easy to make tools that make us slightly better at something that we're already good at, make a better bipolar. But it only is gonna make a little bit of an improvement. And to really make a revolutionary improvement, we have to acknowledge what we're bad at. And what we're bad at is sitting across from a patient who tells us a symptom that we know is located in the brain, but it isn't in one place like the motor system where we know exactly in the brain where that's located. We're talking more about, you know, emotional symptoms or cognitive symptoms and learning about figuring out what to do. And part of it is that that doesn't tell us the answer most of the time. 
people with mental illness have normal looking brain MRIs, or if there's, if there's differences, they're very subtle and, and you need very sophisticated computers and they don't really link very well to, to the symptoms. They're kind of a statistical relationship. There are no blood tests. There's nothing in the blood that tells you why someone has chronic pain. And so what we're left with is our lists. You find a list of symptoms. If someone has all that on the DSM, then they have depression or they have this syndrome or that syndrome. And the reality is, as we know with every other field of medicine, if we basically diagnose people with cardiac disease off of a list, we will make mistakes because the heart is complex and the brain is 50 times more complex, hundreds of times more complicated. In fact, the brain is extremely complex. And as neurosurgeons, we kind of know this, but I think we always have to really grasp at how bad this problem is. So what I'm going to show you over here is the fruit fly connectome, the drosophila connectome. You can see it's been mapped out. Those are the wires and neurons there. And, you know, as you see, this file moves really slowly because it's a massive file to even render something like this. So how much is there? How much, what did it take to do this? It took eight years of work, multiple labs. It took, it's one exabyte of data approximately. So it's a million terabytes. That's more data than the world produced in all forms before 1998, meaning internet, written, music, spoken word, movies, everything. All data that the world produced up to 1998 is about as much is less data than it takes to map the fruit fly connectome. So let's put it in comparison. So that little dot on the left is the fly connectome. And then the human connectome is on the right. So it's orders of magnitude more complex. It has 4 million times as many cells, 10 million times as many connections. And we're also taking for granted that the mammalian organization system is more complex than the um, than the insect. It's even more complex than reptiles. There, it's more, there's more randomness in this. There's more individual variability. And so that's daunting. We do not have computers powerful enough to map the microcircuitry of the brain. But if we're ever going to get at this, even the macro scale is dauntingly complex. Now, if you really start to think, once you think about the wiring pattern and the fact that there are these cells and what's happening in the brain are all these things happening in the sequence. If you look here, this is just a, 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 a simulation of fMRI events happening. And you see these waves. Well, some of those are organized, but many times there's simultaneous events happening in the brain at the same time. So what connectomics really ultimately is, is we have these complicated wires, the, what we can visualize on DTI, which is still only 0.1% of all the connections in the, in the brain, but it's still, and then we have all these areas that are firing together. And even handling the macro scale connectome, the micro connectome, probably impossible without a significant improvement in either computers or, or, or processing speed. But when we start looking at the macro connectome, it's still dauntingly complex. If you look at all the areas of the brain and figuring out signals in them. So when we look at fMRI and, D and diffusion imaging, they've been around for a while. The uh, DTI was first described in the 1980s, fMRI in 1991. So there are th hundreds of thousands of papers on how to process these, and we can learn a lot about the brain. But without artificial intelligence, and more importantly, without looking at the entire situation, if we just only focus on Broca's area, we only know about a small portion of what the brain actually does, and we won't understand cognitive function. Connectomics works from a similar philosophy as genomics. They're an omics. They're taking really big data sets. If you look at this data set, there are 144,000 dots, and every dot on that screen is comparing two different parts of the brain. How, how, how correlated are they? And so it's using big data to understand that map. What's happening ultimately, if you remember from last time, as you lay in an MRI scanner or do anything, the brain is always active. Even if you're not using, say, the motor or visual system, it's firing with other parts of it. These areas keep themselves warm. It's called, it's organized criticality is the technical term. And what they're basically doing is firing together with areas that they frequently are fired to, mostly because they're wired. What we also know 
is that the fundamental cause of mental illness, of chronic pain, probably most things have in part this synchrony of these areas. So what you're looking at, what this cartoon is showing you is we can quantify it. And we can we know that in some situations, areas of the brain fire too much or too little with parts of the brain compared to a normal individual. And if you look down the right, that's a nature medicine paper that shows that there are multiple different patterns, at least four that they identified, though we believe there's a lot more than that. And that these, these patterns predict response to treatment and symptoms. So the, the functional connectivity problem, which is the dyssynchrony, leads to the circuits firing incorrectly, and that leads to symptoms. Okay. So what we know from connectomics from lots of work are a lot of things. And what, what we know is that while well, we've been spending a lot of time making very pretty pictures of DTI and studying gross anatomy, most people who pay attention to this have seen diagrams like this of white matter dissection. But no one in the world has ever thanked me for saving their cingulum bundle or the corticospinal tract. They thank you for saving function. So we only care about anatomy if it explains function. And for example, if we don't know what that does, we don't know whether it's really important. Is it, can you lose it on one side? These are questions of critical importance. And why do we need to update our ideas? There's a couple of reasons. The first is it's not accurate, okay? So when you think about a white matter bundle, let's say it looks like this, what we know is that if you were to look at that area, it looks like a real structure. But in reality, if you look at the axons in there, they are mixed. Their language function, default mode function, or auditory. There's all sorts of things running in there. And the axons don't really care what the axon next to them is doing. They just happen to be running together because it simplifies the brain, not because there's any reason behind it. So when we say, what does the IFOF or the arcuate fasciculus do? They do a lot of things. For example, if you look here, this is our diagram of IFOF. You can see how many different things are running through that bundle. And so I can tell you what I think when some of its functions are doing, but what the reality is, if I were to say, what does the IFOF do? That question is almost meaningless. And that's the arcuate, okay? So yes, it's good to not cut through the center of the bundles, but it's meaningless to say that, well, which function, what we need to pay, pay attention is what branch is it? One of the other reasons why focusing on bundle anatomy and not networks is problematic is that we it gets people to think like in ways that don't make sense. So this is a diagram from a paper that's talking about improving their algorithms. So you can see on the right, that's the algorithm that they are advocating for. And it does a very beautiful corticospinal track. But you can see that they label things as false turns and false continuations. And some of those are false. But the reality is, those might be important. How do we, how do they know? And making a picture that looks like the thing on the right may or may not be helpful given the circumstance. And so people spent a lot of time putting very pretty pictures on the internet that look like this. This is an advertisement for the Mayo Clinic. And it says an answer, but where's the answer, right? Which one of these is telling us the answer to the question? And so if we want this kind of imaging to be more than marketing material, we need to figure out what these things are doing and make better decisions. Making pretty pictures, not going to help this. And so track bundles look nice, but which one of these branches are important? Networks tell you which one are important. And that's why we focus this whole course on networks and surgery. But finally, let's say we want to do other things with diffusion other than do surgery. Let's say we want to say, how injured is this person's tracks? Because we want to prognosticate for stroke or for traumatic brain injury or tell whether a patient's going to wake up out of a coma. Well, if I were to look at a bundle, and let's say half of that bundle has been destroyed by the by the pathology and half the bundle's there. Well, if I only care about the track bundle, I said that track is 50% damaged. But that doesn't make any sense. If you don't put this into terms of, of networks and connectomics, that's actually, that half is 100% and that's 0%. So this is the reason why knowing what this thing is doing 
annotating it, saying what it is, is critical for understanding it and making smart decisions. It doesn't matter that we cut the fat tribe over here, here, or here. Cut is cut. And so ultimately, we need to make tools that actually work the way the brain works. So how does the brain really work? What do we know from the advancing science? And of course, we're changing this all the time. Every year there's new paradigms and I can't go into everything. It's a massive area. But I wanna tell you the ones that I think I can explain to you that are clear, they're understanding of what we would actually do with this in patients. And I think will really change how you think about things. So we talked about networks. Networks are what we focus the course on because they're the most understandable unit of function. And basically this means areas of the brain that are not next to each other that fire together. Now, we talked about different ways to classify networks. These are the seven main axes, DMN, CN, salience, and dorsal tension are new, vision, sensory motor, and limbic or not. We talked about how these networks can be split into core and subnetworks. So for example, the default mode, the central executive ha um, have cores. There's the language system, which is part of the global default mode network, but is it, it's kind of controlled. The DMN core is, is directing some of its function. And we pointed out some of these patterns. Now, this is really daunting at first, but I'm gonna show you that there's a pattern to this of how this map looks. One of the things though, the reason we stuck with the 17 network model is that the core networks seem to be the ones that are the least dispensable. They're the ones that you generally, if you cut them, we can kind of tell you that bad things happen. But how do these networks work? Like, why do they look like this? Well, it turns out if you look at the basal ganglia, so this is the, the striatum, the putamen and caudate, these areas are mostly not motor, okay? They're mostly the CEN core, that's in brown, the language system, that's in red, and the yellow is the default mode core. Now, you also see there's a pink, a little bit of orange, but for the most part, they're the three, the three core networks. Now, if you look on the bottom panel, that little turquoise area, if you compare it to the motor cortex, that's the entire motor putamen. So most of the putamen and all the caudate is not motor. If you look at the cerebellum, only the teal and blue areas are motor. So that's actually not most of the cerebellum. It's not the vermis. It's only a little part of the anterior lobe. So again, this is why when we go cut into the cerebellar cortex, we don't get severe coordination issues in every single patient because most of it is not doing that. It's cognitive. There might be some redundancy built in the system. Now, a couple of things about this that are interesting. So if you look at that, that's not random. That's segmental patterning. We know that the spine is segmentally patterned and the, and the, the brain and the spine form for the neural tube. So that's interesting. And we saw this little triad. Remember, brown is CEN core, yellow is DMN core, and red is language. But you see that same triad here, you see it there, and you see part of it there. You also see it in the cerebellum, and you see it in the putamen, or sorry, the caudate. So why is that? Why do we keep seeing that? So this is where it gets interesting. This is unpublished work that we've done. And what I wanted to do was just test the idea that this is developmental and evolutionary. So what we did was in order to do this, we've got to get the brain from the adult stage into this stage of embryology. The reason to do that is that it makes the, tube, the neural tube in a stage where you might see segmental patterning, just like you do in embryology. So we have to roll back the clock. And also mammals, all most vertebrates have a stage where they look kind of like this. Their brain looks like this. So in order to do that, you have to unfold the temporal lobe. Okay, now most of us, we all know that the temporal lobe makes sort of a C shape. The whole, the whole cerebral cerebrum is a C. But it's hard to really always think, what is the geometry that it took to get into that condition? And so I spent a lot of time making sure I, I thought through this because it's kind of odd, like where does the insula fit in this and everything? And it turns out that the axis of rotation is right here at the Lehman insula in M1. And the temporal lobe, in order, to, you have to unfold it by flipping it upside down, because when it folded in development, it flipped upside down. And we know that that is true, because when you look at rodents on the right, 
and humans on the left, the hippocampus and rodents is upside down compared to uh, uh, higher animals than humans, for example. We know the dentate gyrus is upside down. So in order to turn back the clock, the first thing we have to do is we have to unfold and flatten the brain. So you see that's part of the unfolding. And then we're going to unfold it again until it becomes a tube. So think about this as, the, the, as you look in the page, half of the brain is like this, and you're staring at the convexity. But it's all a tube. There's no temporal lobe at this point. The top of the screen is the temporal lobe. As you can see here, the bottom of the screen is the frontal pole. The insula is over here on the left. Okay. And then the occipital lobe is in the upper left. So that, that's how, how it looks. So if you look at this, there's a really interesting pattern. So I want you to watch it. So if you look at the sensory motor cortex, it looks like that. Now, in front of it, you have the salience network that is in purple in this diagram. The dorsal attention is in green. Those are networks we talked about a few times. You see the exact same thing on the front, on the back of it. So it's mirror image. Now, there's this network in orange called the multiple demand, the ventral attention network we've talked about a little bit. The multiple demand we haven't. It's a very new network. We don't totally understand it. It's only really seen in humans. Most other animals, as you see, aren't going to have much of it. And you see there's the same thing there. Now, the visual system is there, and the auditory system is there. And what's between all of these are this repeating triad. It does that over and over. Now, in order to try to sort this out, is there, is there a pattern that drove our brains to look like this? We did a ton of work. And what we did is we went through every cytoarchitecture atlas that is in existence, from humans all the way back to fish, so we, all the ones we could find. And we put them all into the same thing. So this is a lot of work because the macaque and the rat have atlases that don't have the same name. So we had to figure out who are the analogs and when did it show up and when did a region of the brain show up in evolution? But what we did is we started off by saying, if an area had the same basic cytoarchitecture that was in the same basic place, we were gonna assume it was probably part of the same network. And you get a map that looks like this. Now, when we compare humans and macaques, here's the basic difference. The human has this big frontal module of DMN and language and CEN core, and it has one on the temporal side. They're much bigger. If you look at the macaques, they're basically non-existent in the frontal side, and they're much smaller in the temporal side. And when you get to cats, you go a little bit further back in evolution, they don't have any triads, no triads. So it's two triads so to basically zero. So cats have a salience network, a little bit of multiple demand. They have the dorsal tension. They have the auditory and visual. If you actually look at cats, the auditory and visual cortexes do this. That's their pole. And they only have a little bit of temporal lobe folding. The rat has none. We've actually traced all that back. And so evolution was expanding these networks, okay? The DMNCN core and the language system. And that's really what, what, what happened. So the first question is, the thing I'll say is, as we know, the older the network is, the less redundant it is. So for example, the salience network and the dorsal tension, these go a long way back. And as a result, they're probably not very tolerant. Okay? And we know the SMA syndrome results from damaging the salience network for the most part. So that's not surprising that that's really bad because you know at one point it was the only thing that mammals had. But also, if you're going to look at cognitive functions, again, there's different positions that this happens. Now, interestingly, when you put this tube into its normal location and you line it up with the corticospinal tract going down the spinal cord, which we know has to be true, the white matter pathways are all straight. So the way to think about things like arcuate or IFA is that they're basically intersegmental connections hooking up, mostly hooking up the triads to each other or hooking up visual areas to new triads as you evolve. So when you, for example, if you look at IFOF, it hooked the visual system up to the to this human triad that showed up after macaque. That's what the IFOF is doing. And it gives us some insight on what these things are probably doing based on what, what when, did they, when did they likely show up in evolution. Now, if you line it up like this, where you see the striatum, 
you see the cerebellum. This is roughly in their anatomic positions. So have a look here. Again, all of these things being in the exact position that they are, the caudate and putamen are basically tracing the triads. It makes perfect sense when you see it lined up. If you look at the cerebellar hemisphere, what is it doing? So follow the numbers. Okay, there's two. Then you come here, there's three, four, five, six, seven. So it's basically the cerebellar hemisphere is tracing the second triad and the, and the salience network. It's tracing this one. Now, remember, macaques, that second triad is the frontal pole. Now, if you look, there's the cognitive triad and there's the emotional triad. Macaques don't have much of a cognitive triad. They have a full emotional triad. This is the frontal pole in macaques. These two are new, okay? That triad in the front only exists in humans. So what happened is when you look at this, this is a paper in Cell that came out while we were doing this work, is that macaques, that triad lives here, and humans took this other triad on, and it smashed the networks. That's why they're angled in humans. They're more straight up and down in macaques. So it explains exactly why the brain looks like it does. So what I tell everyone is, if you think that brain networks don't matter, they're how the brain was organized. That's evolution was entirely based on these things. And ultimately, if you say, why should you save the big five networks? Because this is literally what evolution was all about. Uh, but also we have good evidence and we've talked about this before. Okay, so networks are important, but we know that networks will probably not teach us everything there's to know in the brain. And part of the reason is when we talk about really higher cognition, we talk about things like doing a math problem. They don't map really well to networks. So yes, if you destroy the default mode network or you destroy the language system, things like math become impossible because you don't have the, you don't have the architecture. But cognition is actually parts of these networks working together in very complicated ways. So how do we basically make decisions about more complex problems like Alzheimer's or depression? when they're not going to be a single network, they're going to, they're multiple networks. And some of it comes down to the idea of the transdiagnostic hypothesis. Now, this is something that's caught a lot of groundwork and, and we were pretty certain that this is true, but it's the idea that a mental illness like schizophrenia or depression, some people have different combinations of symptoms. And what you can, the transdiagnostic hypothesis says that if we took a symptom like G4, that's anxiety, that there's a set of circuits in the brain, areas of the brain that are out of sync that is causing that symptom. So the neurotransmitters cause the areas of the brain to be out of sync, like we talked about earlier, and that causes malfiring of their areas and the loss of that function. And of course, if we understand this, we can do brain stimulation, we can put electrodes, we do all sorts of things if we know where the circuit is exactly. So the NIH has put together something called RDoC. Now, without going too deep into this, what it's really started to get at is how do you understand cognitive and mental symptoms in terms of brain function? And so what we've done is spent, and again, I've spent a tremendous amount of time on this, is going into the, to the published literature and finding things like reward probability. Okay, so reward probability is how your brain assesses that something good might happen. And you see there's a circuit. You can see right there. It's out of the paper. So we take that and we translate that into, into quick tone. And as you can see, we've done this for every single function. So aspects of reward, aspects of how we make decisions. And you can see on the left, these are all brain regions in, in quick tone. Now we have a, this actually goes on for 10 pages. It's a very long thing. But as you can see, we started to work through where in the brain does this happen? So what we can now do is say, okay, if someone has a problem with reward probability and their circuit is too low, well, they're gonna think negative. They're gonna think nothing good is going to happen because this circuit doesn't work. But if it's overactive, that's also bad because people who are manic think that things are good or going to happen, even if there's no reason to think that. And so now what we know is that there is a circuit that explains this. So depression, schizophrenia, these aren't focal diseases, but they're multifocal. They're not diffuse. It's not the entire brain. It isn't serotonin all over the brain. It's specific circuits 
that cause specific symptoms. And so if you think about this, this means that mental illness is treatable, surgical, to be honest, or at least somewhat surgical, because the medicines can only correct the brain so much. And ultimately, if this circuit is the suicide causing circuit, then that's a threat to the patient's life. Now, so we've thought about the brain two ways. One is network. The second is a series of circuits, okay? But this gets even more complicated. So I want to grasp this. This is a paper out of Japan, and when it was really a phenomenal piece of work. So I want to give it its due. So what these people did is they, they looked at different emotions, and they figured out how to induce them during fMRI. Now, what you're looking at here are the two hemispheres. The midline is at the top of the screen. And right about here is the interhemispheric fissure. So the temporal lobe is at the bottom of the screen. And then in the middle is the occipital lobe. So it's just the brain's unfolded and flat. And what you're looking at is when somebody feels joy, the red areas are active and the blue areas are off. And you can see guilt, different set of emotions, different set. So these emotions involve lots and lots of areas in different configurations. And you might feel it for a certain period of time. But if your brain is going to feel good, it's got to get into that state. And that's a combination of different circuits. So you look, the nice thing about this is we have the key. We now know how to look at a scan and know whether someone's, whether emotion someone's feeling at least at a specific place in time. Now, you can see that area right there, that's the triad. That's DMN and CEN, right? So they play a huge role in it. So again, if you do an operation and you go right through that, the chance that you're going to going through the emotional or cognitive triad to cause problems with emotions is very high. So if you get down to one of the reasons to not go through the middle of these networks is this is the architecture that people feel and think with. But it's very complex. You see all this? These are all the different emotions. We can now look at this on MRI and see it. So in some ways, it's infinitely complex, but it's... In some ways, it's simple. It's DMN, CN, salience, dorsal tension. That's what those that basically explains most emotions. And there are the areas that are present in macaques, so the emotional triad. They're not the stuff at the very frontal pole. Humans and macaques both get mad about things, right? But humans can have this other area that can override that and make decisions, whereas macaques act on emotion. And so people have started to also look how do we learn? And looking at the brain as a series of states. So what they can, you can do, if you look in the, on this upper left panel, it's kind of small. But what you can see is that this is the brain in all of those states. And we can trace that out. Now, what, this really interesting paper that was in Nature, what they did was they found out that people's brains learn in two different ways. This person here on the left has a, what they're learning is different types of tasks. So they're learning memory tasks and uh, uh you know, math tasks, et cetera. And this person's brain uses a common set of states for everything. And then occasionally it goes off into these other different states. And this person on the right goes, every single way they learn is different. They're, they're more parallel. Person on the left, if you look at her, got 71% correct. And the person on the right got a nice. So this is the difference between a, an average student and an honor student. So if we can teach the person with this brain to use their brain like that, it has immense potential. Now, that's often the future. It's just something I think is incredibly interesting. But how do we tackle these really complex problems, right? Because if you think about this, there's lots and lots of data here. And, and, and what we know, there's 0% chance that just memorizing this, we're going to be able to think through these problems. We need computers. We need AI. One way to think about it, and this gets back into the neurosurgical realm, is graph theory. So what graph theory is, is a way to look at very complicated systems by looking at how all these parts interact with each other. So how do you make the brain into a graph? Well, you take a DTI, you put a parcellation scheme like the HCP on it or whatever, and you calculate how many fibers go between every area and every other area. So now you have graph. And the reason you do that is that there are all sorts of techniques for running experiments on the graph. You can start to do other things to it. And so we've published a bunch of papers and we're we'll continuing to do work on what do these things mean in the real world. So I'm gonna show you a few of them of stuff we published and some stuff that's not published. One is this, 
One of them is called centrality or hubs. Now, these cartoons show different ways to determine hubs. So this one on the left is called degree, and it's a hub because three different things talk to it. This one on the right in the middle is a different way to measure hubs. So it's a hub because four things talk, you know, three things talk to it. But this guy A is a really important guy too because he has four things to talk to him. So he's a more of a hub than him because he talks to an important area. And this guy, using an, another technique called page rank, is connected to two really important guys. So he's even more important. And the reason we care about this is that we know that hubs in the brain are different than other parts of the brain. They use different energy. They use more energy. They express different genes. And when Alzheimer's disease or other dementias attack the brain, they go for the hubs first. That's actually where the problem is worse most of the time. Now, the thing we did was we said, well, who are the hubs in the brain? And if you look at this list, these are the top 10 hubs in the brain on average. So what you can see, this little number here is what that, that region, what it normally ranks. So the very this one here ranks either first or second. And then this guy here ranks 21. So some of these guys are down at 300, right? This is a longer list that we cut off. These are the top 10. Now, if we were grading an AVM using the Spetzler-Martin scale, every, those red arrows will get you a point for eloquence. And these red arrows, I would argue, should also get you the point, but they're not in the scale. So hubs are eloquent areas. Eloquent areas are hubs. The reason you get a deficit when you cut an eloquent area is you're cutting into a hub that's highly connected, and it's hard to replace it. That's why they cause deficits. So the, another question we asked, this is a paper that was now published over two years ago, and what we asked, we published this in the Journal of Neuro-Oncology, and what we were asking was, how often do people have hubs in parts of the brain that other people don't normally have hubs? So we're talking about the frontal pole or the parietal lobe. Now, you guys know that the frontal pole is not you know, doing nothing, but for many years, we thought of this as safe. You can do whatever you want up there. And the reality is, you won't get a neurological deficit, but could you get a cognitive deficit because it's a hub? And we know that there are some people that you do a very tiny operation and they have all sorts of problems. Anyone who's been an attending physician for long enough knows that those people, they come back and they tell you all these things are wrong and we don't know what to do, but we know we didn't cause a stroke, so sorry. But what we know is that seven, if you look at the diagram on the right, and I won't go into exactly what that diagram is, but it's very interesting. But if you look at those bars, 7% of people have a hub in a part of the brain that no one else has, that's specific to them, that are everyone else has not a hub. So again, it shows that there are patients out there that have traps in the brain that we didn't know about without graph theory. This is a paper we published uh, a couple months ago, and we actually did a, a seminar on it earlier this week for neuro, the Journal of Neuroecology. And what we're asking about is bypassability. So if I cut that area out, can the signal go around it? Well, sometimes, some places that's not possible and other places it is. So you can look at this different ways. And again, this is a very complicated paper. You're welcome to read it. But in, in essence, if you look at the ratio between these, then in the middle, it's kind of all over the place. But there are certain areas that have mismatches between these two types of centrality, and it matters. Okay, so if you look at the extremes, there's some things that have high page rank and low eigenvector and vice versa. Now, if you were to look at the, this medial temporal lobe, this has a high EP ratio. And these are areas that we can tend to be able to take out, right? And on the other hand, if you look at the DMN and CN, these have a low P or EP ratio. And so what we think is going on is that if you look at some areas, if there's no way around it, the signal just dies. But if you take that guy out, there's all sorts of ways around it. And we can measure that. We can look at them and say, well, there's a path around that. There's lots of paths around that. Or there's not. And we can start to get at the idea of, if I cut it out, will I tolerate it? Again, computers can do that. We can't. And so ultimately, we figured out ratios that help us determine, if I take out that area, what's that going to do to this person's network? And this is something that computers can calculate in seconds. 
Now, here's the, the last one, and this is the most complicated one. So if I, if I look at a graph, that set of arrows is the shortest path. It's the biggest set of fibers I can go between point A and point B. Now, you can do that for every part of the brain. You can measure what's called an average path length. The shorter your paths are in your brain, the smarter you are. So if I take that out, I change the path. And that's what we do with surgery. So what we did was we came up with an algorithm to do every conceivable operation. So every step we calculate a thing called global efficiency, which is path length. And then we did every possible realistic brain surgery. So everything from moving one region to a whole lobe. We didn't do, you know, take out things on opposite sides of the brain or anything. We just did surgeries that are likely to happen in the real world. And then what we did was we just did that to the graph. So I said we can run experiments and we recalculated it. Now, this is where it gets interesting. So it turns out that everyone and every lobe in the brain that we've ever studied, we've studied, we've done this many, many times, looks like this. And what that means is that there are areas there. Each one of those lines is a different surgery that we did on the, on the graph. We did every single person, we did hundreds of thousands of operations on them. And what, and what you can see is that there's always a situation where it's better off to take out more brain than to do, take out less brain that has certain parts in there. Figuring out this relationship took us three years of serious work, lots of people. But what we figured out are there are patterns individuals that we call connectotypes. So we can start to dive in and say that if you have the red connectotype, you don't want to be in this area 7 a.m. You want to be somewhere else. Now, now, there's really deep reasons for this, but ultimately we figured out that there's really only two types of people, how their left parietal, lateral parietal lobe is hooked up. And if you're in that situation, if you're one of them, you want to be in another area because of what it does. So, that gets really interesting, right? And this gives us some ideas on how we can do better surgery. But of course, ultimately what we wanna do if we wanna leverage this is we need to link this to action. We talked about TMS, we talked about how safe it is. And what we ultimately are aiming at, we look at structure, okay, that's graphs get into this. We look at function, okay? And if you take a, a brain, what you're doing when you do the surgery or put a stroke is you're taking out part of the graph. You're doing what we just did in the less exercise. And part of being intelligent is we have to quantify it. That's why I talked about earlier about the tracks of making sure that you're thinking about them correctly, putting real numbers on them. And we've done a lot of work to do this correctly, but also looking at the functional disconnectivity. And ultimately, this thing on the left is what the patient really is. And this is why they have the symptom they have. It's one of the two. Now we talked about how you can actually look at every area. You can see here, these are all the areas in the language system. These boxes are red because these areas are correlated. Language is a network. It talks to itself because it talks to itself, things are firing at the same time. Because it fires at the same time, things are correlated. That's why they're red. And on the right, they're not correlated. That's why it's blue. And this is a patient who has an injury to the arc of fasciculus from GBM. But more importantly, that column is a place in the brain and you can take it out and look at it and you can stimulate it. You can do lots of things to it. We can make targets very easily. So the next question is, well, where do we aim? Well, part, we know that these sort of things are helpful. We know that they're safe. There's class one evidence that's beneficial in, in certain situations. And ultimately what we need to know is how do we look at the structural and functional connectome and make a good plan? But that's connectomic medicine is how do we use these tools to look at the connectome and decide what we don't like. And to figure out that, you know, for example, that red area is too active and the blue areas are not active enough. Now we, we can do this for motor very easily because we know where the motor system is. But as we talked about earlier, mental symptoms, we're gonna require more sophisticated tools. It's gonna to require us to really begin to understand very complex systems and Ultimately, how do we figure out where to aim? And this is what I'm going to get to the last part. And this is what we are doing as a company. And this is what our research is and what we're really trying to take. So what does machine learning come into this? How does it actually work? Well, ultimately, there's a lot of ways you can do machine learning. What, what machine learning, to just demystify for everyone, it's a statistical learning technique that's very good at finding signal that it's learned, that it's been trained to find in a noisy data. 
You can use it for all sorts of things. What we decided to do was to focus on using it to look in the connectome to answer a question that we care about. Is the patient going to respond to treatment? Where do we aim the TMS coil? How, is the patient going to get better after their stroke? Things like this. We built ourselves a hypercluster that's capable of processing a million connectomes an hour if we want to. We never tested that because we don't have a million scans, but we think it's possible to do that. We have tools that can brute force every possible machine learning approach so it gets the best area into the curve. And one of the questions is, okay, what circuits do we look at? And how do we know that they're abnormal? So we, we built and published tools for doing that. So what this tool basically works at, it uses a tree, an algorithm called boosted trees. We don't use certain types of machine learning that have black boxes where you don't, you can't figure out what the how it's learning the answer. We want it to be able to be explainable, but you have to basically work, re-engineer the algorithms to work this way. But what they'll do is they'll tell you what parts of the brain matter. So as you can see in the schizophrenia data, this was actually done with a group in Shanghai. And what we were doing is taking their data and, and helping them find where, where the hallucinations come from. We can take diseases like depression and get down to where do the suicidal thoughts come from. That's what you're looking at in this diagram in this paper. And ultimately, we can link this into QuickTime or other software to figure out where, where do you, what do you aim for and put it into learning architectures. So you can imagine the power when we start to have complete visibility on um, where do these things happen? So a patient shows up with headaches or suicidal thoughts or whatever, or you do surgery and they have depression. First, we'd like to prevent that, but let's say the tumor's already done it. We're no more mysteries. We kind of know where to look. We kind of know what circuits. We can start to study all the circuits and say, this is how this person's reward system is activated. And then the question is, what do we do? And this is fascinating. Now, if you look at the bottom, I've, I've given credit to the person who came up with this idea. This is not my idea. But I think it's a brilliant idea, and I think we need, it's worth studying. It's beautiful. So we talked about how the brain transits through various states. And depending on which region is on or off, different emotions or thoughts happen. So this is theory. But let's say, for example, you have three mushrooms, and this is the brain representing mushroom A, B, and C. So if I want to go from seeing this mushroom to that mushroom, I've got to change states. Well, it turns out that if, if you look at someone's DTI, you can calculate how easy it is to get the brain into this state. So this is the DTI and above is the fMRI. Now, this diagram on the bottom, it's much harder because you have to put energy differently. So if I wanna switch at the top from this state to this state, given how this person is wired, this is easy, but this person, it's a lot harder to go into that state. Because in order to get this brain into if the switch from this state to that state, at the, at the top, I only need to put a plus and a minus, and here I have to put a lot more energy into it. So you can calculate this. You can actually calculate the entire landscape of how different energy states happen in the brain. And you can plot out the transition. How easy is it to get the brain into all these states? We know that there's parts of the brain that do that. That's actually what the central executive network is mainly responsible for, is getting your brain into these states. And we know that the central executive network, if you look at this data, it increases its ability to put the brain into different states in between the ages of 12 to 30. Okay, that's what you're looking at here. So what the central executive network does is as it matures, it lets you do things with your brain that you couldn't do before. That, that's how, you know, cogn you know, cognitive development. But it also allows the brain to maybe put itself into states that you don't want it in, like mental illness. So let's say, for example, we look at this landscape, and you're wired so that landscape's abnormal. So that peak is low, and that peak is high. This is, let's say what we're. This is what it happens to the normal landscape, and the reason it does that is because you are wired differently. Well, if that's the guilt state and that's the joy state, you got problems because it's, it's too easy to get into the guilt state or the joy state. Or let's say this is hallucinations and it becomes easy because you're wired a certain way. This is one of the reasons why people think that schizophrenia doesn't begin to manifest until later in life, even though it's a genetic disease. You've always been wired this way, but until you can eat, reach everywhere on this landscape. Now, the question is, what we, if we want to change this, we want to make actually figure out how do we set people's landscapes differently so we make things harder or easier that we want. And we can now begin to calculate this.
And we've started to do machine learning on these landscapes to try to figure out how does mental illness really work and how do these things really work? And so what we know now is that as you begin to do machine learning on abnormal landscapes, you see things in mental illness that we weren't seeing a couple of years ago. So how can we really make a difference? We need to set up a way of thinking that aligns with how the brain really works, not how it's easy for us to understand. And ultimately, we need this is a math issue, and computers are better at math than we are. So we need to get out of the cadaver lab and stop doing dissections. We've maxed out what we can do with that. And we need to really crank on computers and machine learning because this is the way we're going to actually take this forward. So anyway, th thanks, everyone. I, I know that's a complicated lecture. There's a lot of probably questions. Um, thanks for you know being with me for now five hours or more. Um, and I hope everyone gained a lot out of it because, as you can tell, um, I put a lot of effort into making sure this course was as good as possible. So thanks, everyone. Okay, thank you, thank Michael. Thank you. It's a quite fantastic uh, uh, lecture. And uh, uh, is there uh, some special disease like uh, autism? autism? Uh, did you uh, have some research plan on this kind of special disease that maybe there's some problem in the connections? Oh, yeah, we, we have now about 45 research projects in different parts of the world. Um, I published at least four different projects with different groups in China. And what we aim to do is a lot of these things. We have Our thought is that we can utilize machine learning to begin to understand what's really happening and why do two patients with the same problem have very different symptom profiles. But as we understand this at the circuit level, our, our ability to do things is going to change exponentially, right? So if you know that these three regions and the basal ganglia are the problem, well, it's a lot easier to think about what you could do about that than what we know now, which is we have no idea, right? But the tools, particularly computers, to do this kind of research went from impossible 10 years ago to pretty hard five years ago to easy now. So, yeah. Okay, great. Very interesting. Thank you. So do, yeah. I, do I do use it in every surgery? Yeah, I think as QuickTone, particularly the, the, the first tool we made and cleared is about saving networks because that's something we can do now. It's obvious that cutting through the middle of really important systems can have consequences. And there are people all over the world who are currently using it. So people in India, I'm here in China, we're starting to launch it in China. There's people in the US using it, et cetera. So, and we've written textbooks and everything. So that's, we can do that now. Some of the things I talked about today are future. Now they're not way off in the future, but they're a little bit harder because, but what we know now is we can tell where the reward system and we can quantify it. So it's not hard off before we just have, you know, we can program that into the software and you can see it. That's actually something we're doing right now. So this stuff is complex, but much of it, except if actually everything before the very last part is something that we are very close to doing right now. But what we think about is ultimately as neurosurgeons, we change the brain profoundly and psychiatrists have probably maxed out what they're going to do with medicines. So we need to start joining up and talking to each other because we can help them out a lot. And, you know, they have, there's this bad idea of psychosurgery for the 1950s, but they had no idea how the brain really worked. And they were sticking, doing crazy stuff. And we actually have very detailed ways. We know a lot more than they did about how the brain works. And we had a lot better tools. So we have to reopen up the idea that if you, if you're the problem in the brain is that the circuit is malfiring. Well, if they, that happens in the heart, they just put a pacemaker in or do an ablation or something. That's what they do. And why? Because the, because the bad rhythm in your heart can kill you. Well, that's the same thing with depression. Depression is a rhythm issue. And if it's wrong, it can cause you to commit suicide. Right. So that's a, should be a fixable problem and we should be fixing it. Yeah. And the, uh... I agree with you that uh, <clears throat> uh, in the brain in different uh, person actually have different uh, uh, different networks 
and maybe in the future, maybe we we can use uh, AI to to follow up some pa patients' uh, thoughts and then mimic his networks and then decide what can we do for the surgery. Well, <laughs> I, I think one of the things I tell everyone is people say, oh, oh, where do you think this should be going? And I said, the best scenario for any patient is that we basically tell a robot what we want it to do and then we go get coffee and the robot does that. We will never do better than that, <laughs> right? But w the problem is the robots aren't ready for that, though they're not way off. And we don't know how to program a robot what to do, but there's no way that they're going to do worse th at this than we do, you know, like they're going to be more precise. But right now, we first need to figure out what should a robot be doing. But eventually, yeah, they're going to, you know, if we're doing our job correctly, we should get, we should stop putting our hands in people's brains so eventually. We just can't do that. Not in my career, but someone should. And so at, eventually it's going to tell you, hey, there's a hub that you're about to go through. You might want to go to the right, <laughs> you know, so you're going through a less important part of the brain. And it will have already done all the calculations said, I, I'm, but I've already done that surgery and it's going to go badly for you. Go to the right a little bit. And then it, the robot does the surgery for you. And I don't know, maybe fo focal ultra. We don't know what the answer to it is. From our standpoint, the, the thing that we focus on with our software and our tool is let's make, let's basically make people smarter because no matter what, you're going to make better decisions if you have more better information. So do you think the hub is uh, uh, naturally born or some of the uh, result of the training, learning after the, uh, uh, after bond? Um, I, I think that hubs are, hubs are, the brain is designed and wired genetically to put hubs in certain places, particularly in like the motor cortex and visual system and things like this. And there, and what you know, what we know is this, right? So it, this is a, this to show you how important hubs are. So if you look at aging, right, people's brains shrink, and and we've all seen someone who walks in at ninety who has a lot of atrophy, who's basically normal, okay. And we've seen people who are demented who don't have a lot of atrophy. So atrophy is related to the problem, but it's not necessary. You, you can have dementia without it. So the biggest difference is normal aging, you lose fibers, but you lose fibers across the board evenly. So the hubs and the non-hubs stay the same ratio. They, they go down together. What Alzheimer's does is it flattens it out, it attacks the hubs and makes them all the same. And if you simulate the brain with, where there's no hubs, where everyone is equal, what you get is just a blinking light, like a seizure. So if you think about what, ep what focal epilepsy does is that it's simplified. It doesn't make the problem, the brain more complex. It makes it less complex. So it's, a, it's syncing together. The complexity of the brain is actually designed to make things out of sync a little bit so that you can think. This is not thinking. And so the, the organization of the brain is unequal. And so the biggest evolutionary benefit that we had was to build the brain that way. And the, there's a reason for it. And the reason for the reason we're designed that way is because it reduces the, how much wiring you have to have to hook the brain up. And that got it to where our heads were small enough where we could be delivered alive, right? You know, the, the, the limiting factor is in mammals because we come out of a, a woman's birth canal. If you get the head too big, she won't survive. So everything is designed in the brain to mat, to keep to pack in as things as tightly as possible for that reason. And the hubs are a way to reduce wiring significantly. And so we're we're genetically designed to have hubs. It's just that in some people they put a hub in a weird place for reasons we don't understand. So do you think this uh, because by now like uh, the surgery for the the uh, psychiatric disease norm normally was prohibited. But do you think it be, can be uh, maybe repopular after we know more profoundly the, the networks? Maybe some disease have some special target we can treat. 
I think that the answer is that we're very close to that being reality. So for OCD, mm -hmm. people have done it, right? So we know that there's some merit to that in some patients. For depression, what there's been some trials and the trials were initially called negative, but when you actually look at it, there are some patients who, who, and these are severe depression patients. These are not people who failed one medicine. These are people who've been committed and made suicide attempts. So very sick people. And there's some people that the DBS changed their life and other people that did nothing. So there's a lot of theories on it. The, the theory that Helen Mayberg, who ran the trial, is, is that the people who were put, they were trying to put it in the subgenual singlet. Her theory is that they were putting it, they, they were kind of aiming at the cortex, and you actually want to be in the white matter bundles. So we figured out how to automate that, where it can tell you how the, where, the, where it's basically where the forceps minor, singulate, and uncinate all intersect. Um, but... Other theories are that you actually need to put it further back in the median forebrain bundle. There's some people in Germany who's done some studies with that. But I also think the other thing, too, is there's really no such disease as depression. There's lots and lots of very similar diseases. And the reason we know that is, you know, think about mental illness. They frequently give people a diagnosis of depression, anxiety, OCD, and some personality disorder, right? When is in your entire neurosurgical career, have you met a patient for the first time and given them four diagnoses? You know, the closest you're going to get to this moya moya and they had a stroke, which are related problems, or there's trauma and they have a subdural and an epidural, right? But they're both from the same cause. We never give people four completely unrelated diagnoses. At least that's very, very common. And the reason is because we have very clean and simple diagnostic categories and they are taking a problem that's probably thousands of problems. And they say, well, these things come together a lot. And that's true. But the reality is, if you look at the paper for the talk at the beginning, we know that not everyone responds to the same treatments. So the way to think about it is how we treat mental illness now is we say we know there's a bone broken somewhere in the body. And we know that putting a cast on broken arms helps. So we can't give everyone an arm cast, but some people walk in with broken legs and we're like, I don't know why this guy didn't respond. They have a different disease. It's a similar disease, but it's a different disease. And the best way to think about it is you can get a diagnosis of depression being suicidal and crying or anhedonia and no energy. Totally different symptoms in different parts of the brain. And that really means that the, the diagnostic categories that they came up with in the 1960s were the best they could do in the 1960s. And we've just kind of tweaked it a little bit over the years, but it's not really how the bot, the brain really works. And we now know that there's better ways to do it. So as we begin to get better understanding, it's inevitable that some kind of brain modulation is the solution to this problem for many patients because, you know, the response rate to medicine is 40%. So the 60% of people don't get better. And that's millions and millions of people. And, it, you know, you add it up, it's probably, you know, 10% of the population of the world or something like this. So you get down to it, it's a huge, huge problem. And what we now know from the imaging is that it's not a focal problem. It's not one part of the brain, but it's a multifocal. It's not all over the brain either. Because it was all over the brain, we couldn't do surgery for it. So I think that as people in psychiatry have started to get back to the idea that the psychosurgery of the 1950s is not the same thing that we're talking about today, where we're more precise. And particularly as we get better imaging and we start to really understand what the target should be in patient selection, and there starts to become success, and particularly with TMS, we know that TMS is a focal treatment that works, that there'll be, it will, it's going to start opening up it, because the, what we're doing now isn't working for many patients. Yes. In the real patient, actually, we, we have another network of vessels, vessels ne network. Yeah. <laughs> it's always com yeah. combined with the, the neurons. Yeah. <laughs> so it's yeah, even, yeah. even more complicated. Oh, yeah. The, it's, the, these things are very complex. What I think we have to realize is that for the first time ever, we have computers that are powerful enough to tackle this level of complexity and put it in a way that we understand. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Any questions? Yes, Michael, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Hello. 
Michael, this is Dr. Harshad Parikh from Mumbai, India. Excellent yes. lecture. Unbelievable thoughts are coming in our mind. And we hardly know anything about the brain now after listening to your all talks. Uh, there was some query which was going on, thought process in my mind. Those patients who are behaving, in my opinion, those who are uh, just randomly killing the people have got a different circuit in the mind than the normal people. The structural they may be saying. Do you think this could be a psychiatric illness and could be tackled by this problem? Or this uh, can be targeted in by this cups. So, so well, I mean, the answer is if you if you go spend time watching videos of people who are serial killers and they talk about what what why they do it, right? This is incomprehensible. Yeah. yeah. So number one is that they feel a compulsion to do it. Number two is that they get a reward out of it. And number three is many of them have anger issues. That's the three things. Those in, in our doc are called frustrative non reward. Uh, reward anticipation and uh, uh, this basically what's called the cognitive decision making reward perception. So what happens is those are circuits in the brain. Everything that someone does, particularly if someone feels compelled to do something, there's somewhere in the brain that that's happening, right? So if we say if you get down to when people talk about psychosomatic diseases, and we we say we think about them as like phantom things. No, it just means that it's not in your back. It means somewhere in the brain there's something. So theoretically, there is a answer to this question somewhere in the brain. The nice thing about MRI-based connectomics is we can get quite a ways down the path to answering that now. And so what we imagine is, you know, with enough time and enough em emphasis, we'll at least have a pretty good idea. And and while I've never tested serial killers in my scanner. We all know that there's something wrong with them. If you go listen to some of them, some of them are very rational sounding individuals who do terrible, irrational things because they feel compelled to do it. Well, as we begin to understand that, probably there's something in their life and or their genetics that wires them a certain way so that they're, they get a reward out of murdering people. And, you know, same with a lot of other pathological events, you know, all these paraphilias and other you know, sexual disturbances and things. We don't understand why someone would do that, but there's probably some something, some problem in the reward system of these patients. And we can we can image the reward system now. We can see it. And as we begin to get more information, we'll start to know where the problem is. And once you know where the problem is, we've got a lot of tools. We can start trying stuff, right? Has anybody studied on this? Or have you tried to see the problems of the connection. So and the only person who has, has put any effort into this is Mike McDermott and scanned it, and he can tell you exactly, but some number of people who are on death row for many murders and uh, in Miami. So I, I don't know where he's at with that, but he, he has a lot, he has interest in that. But uh, of course, we're always interested in answering these kind of questions, right? Because because they have huge importance, right? Everyone recognizes that we don't want serial killers in the world. And some of these people probably don't want to be serial killers, but they they have this some terrible thing that's going on in their brain, and we've got to lock them up to protect the public from their behavior. But if we could if we could tell that a kid ahead of time is developing that and prevent that from developing any further, that would be great, right? We don't we don't want to sort of, we don't want to find out after the fact. But that's the way to think about it is if we know that the wiring allows certain states to become possible in the brain, it makes them energetically easy and favorable. We can start to find out that some people are wiring themselves in ways that are going to set themselves up for mental illness later in life. And then that's a huge question is how do we prevent people from going through lives of misery? It's a profound topic. Um, what I say is we don't have the answer for that now. But it isn't fantasy anymore. Like we, you know, with enough data and time, we will answer this question or at least get a lot closer to it. Thanks, Michael. Amazing, amazing research work you have done. And you have thrown a new light on us, the, the brain connect prompts, much more in details than what we knew all this time. Amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. Victor. Are you there, Victor? Hello, hello, hello. Hi. Professor Chu. Hi. Uh, it's Hi. really amazing. Hi. And you told uh, uh, to Professor Michael that also fantastic lectures. If uh, neuroanatomia 
by itself is difficult, a little difficult. Uh, if you try to integrate this in neurophysiology, neuropsychic, neuropsyche, and about uh, also neuroanatomy, this is very, very complex. So congratulations uh, for uh, Dr. Michael. Uh, you are doing a really good job. So uh, I have uh, been working during uh, 33 years, vascular anatomy of uh, the brain and also of the spinal cord. And uh, I need to review step by step what you are doing because uh, this is really, really fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Vinshu, Dr. John Bennett, and Dr. Michael. Yes, uh, if you really yes, want to uh, get into, if you really want to get into the details, uh, we published uh, uh, we published our uh, eight uh, our, um, atlas in atlas operative neurosurgery. In operative neurosurgery, in neurosurgery. And it goes all it the goes details of how we all the details of how we any, any possible any fact possible about the brain. About the brain. Are you doing some job about connectomics in uh, spinal cord? No, we haven't done that, and uh, there's a couple of reasons, but some of it comes down to the second is, 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 sorry to interrupt you. Yes, sorry. Yes, yes sorry. someone's calling me. Yes, someone's calling me. Uh, so the answer is that the other reason we can't come to the spinal cord is Connectomics is one of the best reasons is that there's so many different wires and they're all different. Whereas in the spinal cord, we're all kind of the same. And the spinal cord's relatively small. And the spinal cord's relatively small. Because little fibers get through different. Now, we could now, think through it. And think there are people who've done it. There are people who've done it. We just haven't tackled that. We've been focusing on that. There's a lot of work. Thank you, Professor Michael. So, Professor Michael, I have a Professor question have about, a question about, about the concept. 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 Uh, so, as I understand uh, that, as we I can do that in the operative planning and know what the total original is. Excuse me, Mohammed, excuse me. Someone has the program open. Could you please uh, turn, off turn off all your programs other than Zoom? Turn off all your programs other than Zoom? Uh, actually, it's a resonant sound. Uh, actually, it's a resonant sound. Mike. 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 Yeah, now yeah, it's good. Okay, so for global efficiency concept, uh, as I understand from your talking, uh, that will help us in preoperative planning. So it, it will show us, the computer can uh, show us the, the shorter axonal pathway. So that, that pathway, we have to preserve it and we can cut the, the, uh, the other connections. Is that true? Did I get it uh, right? Yeah, what it's basically saying is this. Think about think about the brain has got all these connections, right? And when you cut something, you're not only affecting what you cut, but you're affecting the things that are running through that. And so when you start to really, your mind, could get, it can explode really quick when you start thinking about all the possible things that that disconnects. What global efficiency does is it takes a computer algorithm and scales that through the whole graph very fast. And so in a short period of time, it can say, well, this is what you do to the, you know, how, how, what to the whole, the whole brain, the entire net as a network. And it can look at relationships that you can't possibly understand. So what it means is what we know is that the, sh so it, let's say, for example, I want to, I'm a signal and I've got to go from Wernicke's area on the, on the left side to the right frontal lobe for whatever reason. Well, the, the, the fewer different connections I need to make to go from here to here, the better, because the signal travels faster. And when you start talking about these higher cognitive functions and lots and lots of things are firing, that becomes really important. 
So what we know from studies is that in general, the shorter your path is to get from any place to anywhere else, here to here to here, here, you can calculate that for the whole brain. The shorter your paths are, the, the smarter you are, the higher your IQ. Okay. That's probably what IQ is, is how, how efficiently your brain is wired. And we know that most of the genetics that of genes that we know we've identified that affect IQ affect axonal stability and wiring efficiency and energy handling, right? So how, how, how well do you lay big axons that shorten your paths? So when you cut the connections, you're lengthening the path. It may be very little or it may be a lot, depending on what connection you cut. And there's just no way that you can look at somebody's brain and know what that is ahead of time. But a computer can do that like that. And what we can imagine, when we don't have data on this. This is something nobody's done this experiment. The experiment we showed was just theoretical. If you cut this, what happens? What the real thing would be, well, the more you drop someone's global efficiency, the more their IQ drops. Now we have a real thing that now we have to take that seriously. Because in that case, you might change your operation. So, for example, let's just use the glioma example as a simple one. If I knew that going from 97%, or let's say this one, if I knew that the difference between a gross total resection and a super maximal resection was going to drop your IQ by 10 points, we'd have a discussion of what the trade off is, right? Depending on who that is. And so, right now, we don't know that. We don't know what happens when we take a margin around is, or is this, does this do nothing to the paths in the brain or does it destroy them? We don't know. But if we know that there's a consequence to that in that individual, and what we know is that shorter paths means smarter, right? We don't know that changing someone's path changes that, but there may be that they're an epiphenomenon and they're not directly related, but it seems probable that if you're really lengthening somebody's paths in the brain to com communicate information, mm -hmm. That it's going to have an effect on intelligence in some form, and so this this idea allows us to start to think about finding relationships in the brain that we didn't know were there, and and couldn't. It's just humans aren't aren't capable of that. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Michael, you mentioned the bypass uh, of the network. Do you have some uh, evidence uh, like on MRI, like you you can find this bypass for the uh, connections? Yeah. It's fairly easy. We, we pub all the, that data that we publish is actually MRI data. It's published in mm -hmm. Um And what we've done is we've said, what we do, how we've been looking at these graph metrics, because essentially people have been doing it for a while. But what we, no one's really said is, what does this actually mean biologically? And what we said was, well, we know what a lot of these parts of the brain do. We know how tolerant they are to doing surgery, right? So in the bypass literature, we just said was, well, okay, if the medial temporal lobe has the, is the most bypassable, we've been cutting up the medial temporal lobe for a long time, and we know that it doesn't have horrible consequences. And if the motor cortex is a hub and it's very high, and we know that you can't cut that out without obvious consequences, that's useful because it says, well, okay, if I see this in an unusual situation that's unique to that patient, it may be telling me something that I couldn't have found on my own. I, you know, me telling you that you can remove the temporal, medial temporal lobe sometimes is useful, but we already kind of know that. They figured that out in the 50s. What you can imagine, though, is the question of, we know that in some people, when you get rid of the amygdala and hippocampus, there are serious consequences. And this is how we could address that ahead of time. And what do we do? We could, there's a million things you could do differently. Maybe you don't do epilepsy surgery, right? I mean, you can get into that discussion. But right now, we don't know. People do WADAs and things like that. But we all know that that's not an ideal test to give sodium amytol to half the brain and see what happens. That, that, that's probably not very precise. So what we would hope is that eventually the computer would just say, this is not a bypassable hippocampus. And then you, you know what you're dealing with then. And then you, you can make up your own mind or you can try to maybe even tailor the operation to see what happens, right? There's a lot of different ways you can think through this topic, but yeah. Yeah, thank you, thank you. 
Takashi. Uh, good evening. Hi. Uh, good evening, I'm uh, Dr. Takashi Kon, Tokyo, Japan. Thank you for the lecture. Uh, I've heard your lecture uh, last year in Kobe, uh, the Brain Tumor Society in Japan. So yeah, yes. I learned a lot of connectomes. And this time, so uh, various uh, fields of connectome, uh, you developed your research. I'm very excited and uh, I read, read your paper and uh, expecting much more for future uh, development of research. And as for epileptic surgery, so the as for connectome brain function will uh, trajectory, uh, brain function will change uh, after the, uh, uh, statistic status epileptics. Uh, so that kind of uh, change will be uh, verified your, uh, by your research, by your program. So I expecting your future uh, development and I uh, check in uh, your paper. Thank you uh, for the lecture. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, I mean, we know that epilepsy has connectomic features. Mm -hmm. The real interesting thing that I've seen is we know that if you treat the lesion site, the epileptic focus site, mm. that that gets rid of the seizure a lot of the time, but sometimes it doesn't. And so what people have started to say is, let's say we look at the, the epileptic focus, and then we look at everybody who has a strong connection in the graph. Mm. And what you do is you resect the part of the graph that's that, that has high degree centrality to mm. that area. People mm. have shown that that strategy actually gets better epilepsy results. So... Mm. As we begin to understand that parts of the brain, epilepsy can rewire, is how it's rewiring is it's strengthening connections with things that you don't mm -hmm. want it to be connected. So we can start to think about the dream again, and this thing would just look at the MRI and be like, this is your, this is your focus. And, the, and if you cut, if you lesion these areas, then it will get rid of the epilepsy. That's what mm -hmm. we want. We're not there yet, but if we have enough data, machine learning and the data will eventually solve this problem as well. We just need to get data and we need to crank it through computers till it tells us what we need to hear. And we have to collect the right kind of data. And we as neurosurgeons are most positioned to do this because we understand what the right question to ask is. The machine learning people don't understand the right question to ask, but they know how to answer that question if you tell them what that what the question is. Thank you. Thank you, Michael and the John. Well, Yeah, I think it's time for us to close this lecture. And uh, Michael, what what uh, what's the next session you will? Well, I can keep topic. teaching the course. We, we were thinking <laughs> about uh, well, most of my stuff is about connectomics, but um, uh -huh. uh, you know, like I said, I'm happy to teach whatever course anybody wants. Um, this was planning on being my last lecture for this course. But what we can do is give the course again at some point in the future, or if anyone has another topic you want me to cover, uh, I can go in all er, everything I have a slide on there. I can give an entire hour lecture. On. I've got more material than anyone knows what to do with because I've been. This is what I've been doing for the last ten years. Okay, thank you. So I hope to meet you in Shanghai. I'll see you next, next week. week. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. yeah. You know. You know. Ben, you said a while back that uh, artificial intelligence is the future of neurosurgery. And this uh -huh. may, may be one of the ways it's going to get there. That's true. Yes. Okay. Thanks, everybody. And we'll thanks, be okay. Watching. Thank you. We'll be Thank in you. Touch. Yes. Keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Bye bye. Bye, bye. Bijan. You know, you know, Victor, I'm going to pretend I know what. Uh, they said a lot of times, um, you know, Victor, you know, Victor I don't, I didn't I understand. Don't, I didn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be honest. <laughs> but it's good stuff, right? It's good stuff. It's good right? stuff. Yes, of course. Yeah. Really nice, really nice lectures. Uh, I need I need to follow them uh, little by little, step by step. Uh, I, I I have uh, been some some job about uh, the paper of uh, uh, some uh, neuronal circuits 
in uh, some psychiatric illness and they are very, very difficult. It's not easy to understand the, the neurophysiology of uh, that uh, disease. Mm -hmm. But he's got a deep uh, really, understanding. really nice, really nice, really nice, really nice lecture. Yes. Hello, Harshad Parekh. Hey, there's Harshad. Okay. How you doing, Harshad? Hi, Victor. Hi, Victor. Hi, Victor. Hello, Harshad. Hi, Victor. Hi, Victor. How are you? Uh, fine. You. I think uh, we are going to meet. We are going to meet in Feb on February next uh, year. On Where? February, there Where? is going to be a, a a good congress in Mumbai. Correct, 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 correct. Yes, Victor, Victor, yes, the globe I think. Uh, Victor, Victor, the globe <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I think uh, I, I will go. Yes, yes, we are going yes, to meet in Mumbai. Meet in Mumbai. Definitely. Ho definitely. Hope to meet you there. No, I will definitely make a point to see. Yeah, Victor, how are yes. How are streets? Oh, really beautiful, beautiful Greece. Wonderful place, isn't it? Place, isn't it? It's wonderful. I visited the, the uh, Acropolis and also uh, I visited two islands, Poros and um, another island. Really nice, Na really Naxos, nice. Naxos, Naxos, I went to Naxos, Naxos beautiful. I went to Naxos, beautiful. Yes, yes, you, of course. You know, all yes. those islands, you know, it's kind, kind, of like kind of like a law. They have law. to be white, to all be the houses on those, house. islands. on those islands. Yes, yes, really, really nice place, yes. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. It, it, beautiful. To me, it, that's the best trip I ever took. That's the best trip I ever took. Yes. Yeah. I, I think uh, next year is going to be very, very nice uh, because uh, I was invited to Mumbai on February uh, 24 to 26 in the Congress of uh, Asian uh, Neurosurgery. So okay. uh, I, 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 I will go to Mumbai. Uh, oh, I cool. want to visit oh, cool. Dr. Harshad Parekh. He is very famous in Mumbai. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Victor, I'm going to see you. And Abby, too. Abby, too. Abby, yes. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, also, yes. also to visit Dr. Atul Gol and yes. all of you. Yes. Is Dr. Jari uh, in, in Mumbai? In in Mumbai. I think uh, excuse Pujari, me. In, uh, Mumbai too. No, Mumbai. Yes, yes, yes. The Pujari is also go to yes, be there. The Mumbai yeah. mafia. Yes. Mumbai mafia. Yes. <laughs> Mumbai. True, true, true. true, true. We need to see the we connect on some the the Mumbai mafia. Mumbai mafia. Great to hear you. Okay, gentlemen. Okay, thank you for gentlemen. Thank you for thank you support. Thank you for support. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.